very much to our speakers who are here. They made it through uh, extreme uh, weather conditions and traffic conditions and snaked their way all the way around small roads through uh, Santa Cruz to be here. So I think we are pretty much ready to go, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Pablo. All right, thank you. Uh, Sam, please take the floor. We are accumulating delay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, oh, there we go. Thank you, everybody, um, and welcome to the um, second session. So uh, for those of you who maybe came in a bit later, um, I'm Sam Mitchell. I'm a volcanologist and marine geologist at the University of Bristol, but I'm also currently chair of the Commission of Submarine Volcanism that operates through IFC, so the International Association of Volcanology. Uh, there's just some uh, bits of information over there on the right hand about the IFC Submarine Commission. Uh, so we do have a website, we have social media, we organise uh, webinars, we helped uh, co-organise a workshop in Germany a couple of months ago, and also um, a, sub a submarine symposium for early career researchers uh, that was just a couple of weeks ago online that a few people in the room took part of as well. So what I want to do today is kind of incorporate some stuff about the commission, but also broader Vulcan um, marine volcanism in general, kind of into what we've been talking about here already uh, with regards to the Canary Islands, in particular, incomplete records, data opportunities, and how we can strive for more equitable research. And so I thought a good introduction to this was actually some of the words that we use in our statement for the Commission of Submarine Volcanism. So I will uh, just read this out anyway. So representing over three quarters of global volcanic activity and as one of the most cross-disciplinary areas of volcanology, the commission remains a vital part of IFC infrastructure. So it's one of the things we have to remember. Of course, global marine volcanism is huge. It's, it's the biggest area of volcanology. And yet we're actually one of the smallest groups that operate in this area. And a lot of that comes down to, of course, infrastructure, accessibility, and what we have to work in this area. And so this was written a couple of years ago, but it's still, it's still pertinent today as the world slowly recovers from a far-reaching pandemic and research, oh, research vessels fully return to the water. We enter an era of exploration where new technology methods and digital capabilities and long-needed diversity and inclusion discussions are at the forefront of marine geoscience. So not just submarine volcanology, but also marine geoscience. Is that okay? Is there a bit of feature? I'll try that one. Thank you. Okay, hopefully there's a little less feedback on that. If not, maybe I'll move around the room. Is that a lot better? Yeah. Um, yep. Okay, I think that location actually works. Uh, yeah, so it's just getting this idea that things have changed over the last couple of years and our mindset to marine volcanism has also changed. And there's many different things that have been developed in digital tools, AI learning over the past couple of years that we can really, really use. Uh, likewise, so even though uh, the current submarine volcanology community is relatively small within broader volcanology, we only expect this discipline to grow as more of the seafloor is mapped and global exploration efforts become more financially and techno technologically feasible. Increasing collaborative efforts in the marine sciences within volcanology, just like is happening here with the Volcana Symposium, provides further opportunities to expand not just the commission, but this network in general across the world. And like I said then, an uptake in digital teaching and outreach resources over the past uh, few years present an opportunity to bring volcanism and marine geoscience to more people through the things that we do in the commission. So seminars, workshops, outreach initiatives. And that's what we're hoping to do over the next few years as well. And then just finally, some of the things that we're hoping to go ahead with. So this is a QR code to our website anyway. Uh, championing efforts in leadership development for early career researchers, improving access to equitable and inclusive opportunities for uh, not just members within our commission, but anyone involved in marine volcanism in general, and then enhancing impacts and outreach on a global scale and collaboration within the marine sciences. Because volcanology on its own on land is one thing. Once you add that into the ocean, as we've seen, you add all these other disciplines you need marine biologists, you need um, physical oceanographers, chemical oceanographers, you need robotics, technology, and that all changes once you go down uh, beneath the waves. So it's a real opportunity for us to try and grow this as much as we can and to strengthen those ties. So this is just a reminder of some of these things, for example, our webinar series over just the past um, 
four months or so, we've had five different webinars and we'll continue that into the new year as well. And we try to hit lots of different areas um, within marine volcanology. So uh, from geophysics to uh, remote sensing, um, to um, experimental, uh, experimental opportunities, and then also uh, computer modeling as well. So we'll continue that going over the next year um, with a new uh, webinar series online, which is also open to all and there's no charge. Uh, we also, you know, encourage outreach opportunities, which is something I would also encourage everybody in this room to also take part of, particularly we're all, we've got some interest in marine coastal volcanism. It doesn't even have to be marine. The idea behind this project, My Deep Sea Volcano, is encouraging people to go to a classroom, whether it's someone they know in person or even online, to go to a classroom, deliver outreach, and then after the fact, get the students or whoever, the children, to actually draw what they've learned. Because sometimes we do outreach and education in initiatives, but we don't follow up on the impact or how effectful that has been. If you do this through artwork, you can see just how impactful your research has been. So this is from a group of um, a Japanese middle schoolers, so I think they're about 12 years old, who were given a talk by one of our commission members. And the detail of the little things they were, they weren't told to draw a hydrothermal vent, or in some cases, um, I'm trying to remember some of the details on here, there's a depth profile on this. They've written the depths at which things happen. They've labeled secondary vents. We're not telling them to do this. These are the little details they've remembered. So artwork and storytelling is a fantastic way to ensure outreach has been effective. And so that's just an example of some of the things we're doing. It doesn't have to be deep sea volcanism. It can be whatever area of geoscience, marine science you work in, but this is a really effective way to get, to get the word out to the masses. And then some of our other more like EDI initiatives, which leads on to what I'll continue to talk about now in terms of opportunities. Uh, just some of the things we're striving for is uh, partner organizations, international coverage, organizing events spread out over different time zones to ensure accessibility, and same with meetings and seminars, committing to selecting a diverse range of speakers for our online seminars and keynote speakers at conferences. So whether this is in uh, gender, ethnicity, um, uh, sexuality, all, all matters to show that we can highlight the diversity we have within our field. Early career representatives working closely with the committee and organizing events to create more opportunities for early career researchers and students in their own career development. Striving to create equitable opportunities within um, CRSV, particularly for early careers and currently underrepresented groups. And quite a key one as well um, is addressing hist history of colonization and lack, lack of inclusivity in the earliest years of marine exploration and marine geoscience. And so th these are lots of different things that are tying into our initiatives and the things we are doing, but some of this will now tie into thinking about the Canary Islands. So thinking back to research records, where do the data gaps lie, particularly when we look at um, activity related to marine environments? Subaerial eruptions can lose material to the submarine realm very easily, particularly on ocean islands. If you think about how much tephra, how much ashfall, how much pyroclastic flow material and landslides go offshore, and it becomes so much more difficult to track that activity once it's beneath the, the ocean surface and also to know how far it's gone. Likewise, submarine eruptions lose material quite easily by currents, by different layers within the, the ocean itself, and also by material rafting. We talked about you know, the lava balloons uh, from El Hierro is one good example of material staying on the seafloor and then some of, in, some of it traveling very far away because there's difference in the density of your very light, more like pumice material versus dense lava, and so you get a real separation. So the submarine records, um, can be very, very well preserved for things like tephra layers and ashfall that settles very nicely in watery environments, but it's poorer for things like flows or low density material. Um, there's also biases when it comes to the shoreline uh, versus distal. So sometimes if you go to the shoreline and you try to sample submarine material, it can be quite chaotic and you can have flows destroying material. Likewise, if you go very far away, you might capture some of the ash fall, but you lose those records of more proximal activity like pyroclastic flows. And likewise, that ties into like shallow versus deep as well. It's a lot easier, it's a lot more cost-effective to do shallow research than it is deep research. 
And so we have to bear that in mind that we don't bias our interpretations of what we do and what we analyze based on our ability to only access shallow um, systems. So in a push for lower costs, uh, deeper, uh, deeper sensors and deeper technology is really, really key. And something that's already come up today as well is really poorly constrained frequency timescales. Um, I think Sharon was mentioning it uh, before talking with um, Luke and Brian as well, is um, missing records that we've not recognized yet. Uh, so frequency of explosive activity in particular. And so the time scale of eruptions over long, long periods of time, how frequently do large and small eruptions actually occur? So these are basically the, the big data gaps that we're looking when it comes to particularly ocean islands for subaerial and submarine activity. So what can we do to actually address some of this? A few things that we have to bear in mind is that there are two ends of a spectrum uh, for scientific uh, global bias when it comes to research in this realm. There are countries and regions that have deep sea capacity. And what I mean by deep sea capacity is having the technology available to explore the deep sea realm, having the expertise, having the resources and the finances to do that. That's what we mean by deep sea capacity. So there are countries that have that and regions that have that. Um, and they have the samples, they have the questions, and they have the archives, but they don't necessarily have the people power and the time to analyze everything they collect because they're always out at sea collecting more and more data and building up archives. Likewise, on the other, send, on the other side of this, there are places around the world that have either no or a more limited deep sea capacity, but they might have the people time and the expertise to actually manage that. And I think that's a really, really key area in global, Vulc um, not just Vulc marine volcanism, but volcanism in general. There is so much data out there, but sometimes people might be gatekeeping their data, not intentionally or maliciously, but just because that's, they have their archives, they have their resources. But there are people out there, particularly in the global, global south, where they have the people, time, and expertise that could be working on data. And so reaching out and broadening our collaborative circles can help us address um, these gaps in research. And so taking this now back to obviously these two events that we've been looking at uh, for Togoro submarine volcano and the coastal lava delta eruption of Cumbre Vieja, um, what about so like larger scale activity for more explosive events? Because obviously there's material that goes into the ocean from both of these, but it doesn't necessarily travel very, very far, or at least not in very large quantities. And so one big example that I want to highlight here is an amazing database, which sadly kind of got swept under the rug because it came out during the early stages of the pandemic, which is VaultCore. And this was an absolute mammoth, a phenomenal piece of work where they went through um, hundreds, if not a few thousand marine TEFRA cores from ocean drilling missions and identified which ones have layers of ashfall and TEFRA within them. And within all of this global um, map, they found 35,000 vis visible TEFRA occurrences. And that's not even thinking about the smaller, finer ones. And so these um, orange and red dots that you see around are ones with 10 to 100 TEFRA layers or over 100 TEFRA layers just within a single core. And if we just zoom in on this area over here, we can see obviously there's a concentration around the Canary Islands, but then also some that are a bit further away as well that might capture some thin ash layers from other events. And this is just from deep uh, sea drilling missions. This doesn't actually account for um, relatively shallow coring like piston coring. And so there's even more data out there uh, from, from other records. There we go, yeah, further opportunities from other coring missions. So in terms of opportunities for improving our records of eruption frequency, these kinds of cores are really, really key to looking back at the big explosive past of the Canary Islands, and not just on land, but also um, coastal, um, shallow submarine. Pablo talked before about you know, the possibility uh, for such say in eruptions as well. So all of these are really, really key. And so this, is help, this would help build up our spatial and also time-based extent of ashfall from all of these islands. It could potentially help us identify previously unknown eruptions altogether, different eruption styles that we may not have seen in the historical record, potentially different compositions. We think we've probably characterized most compositions now within the Canary Islands, 
But there could still be surprises out there that lie in uh, TEFRA records on the seafloor. And also identifying new centers. So we talked uh, before, Eugenio mentioned about um, uh, Medeo and Henry Seamount as well. You know, there could be other locations that we can track records back to to identify other potentially active or previously active submarine centers. Five minutes, thank you. And so improving accessibility and knowledge of previously collected data is really, really key to generate equitable research in other countries, uh, and particularly for the countries in question where they may not have the ability to do that research themselves. So this is just an example from the, uh, 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 the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory database that they run through NOAA. So this is an index to marine and lacustrine geological samples. So this is basically, and I've just zoomed in here, you know, on the Canary Island area, but you can see every single one of these symbols are, I've, it's I've pulled up in a box here on the side, are different cruises that have collected different types of samples. And this is all available to look at. You can go straight to this website, look at an area, pull up the cores, pull up the information about that core, about that rock sample. Sometimes you have to do a bit of digging. So for example, here I looked just offshore of um, um, between um, Gamera, the Henry C. Mountain, also um, El, El Hierro there as well, just picked out one of these samples. And that sample is held in the British Ocean Sediment Core uh, Research Facility, and it's a piston core. And there's potentially information in that core that might help Canary Island research. So it's just to put that out there. And that's just one example, you know, from the British um, Ocean Sediment Core. All of these are different repositories of information around the world that could hold keys to really, really important marine information. Um, I can, I'm also happy, you know, uh, to send these slides, and obviously there's QR links to anyone who's interested. This is all completely open. So then how, how do we also make ocean volcanism research accessible to the global community? This was an, another fantastic compilation of data. So this was the global deep sea capacity assessment done by the Ocean Discovery League uh, just last year. And they basically put out a huge questionnaire to countries all around the world and built together this idea of deep sea capacity. Which countries have the ability to do marine research or facilitate it and which ones do not? We actually, uh, one of our recorded webinars is from the director of the um, Ocean Discovery League, Katie Croft Bell. And so you can find that an, on our commission website as well if you want to hear more about the deep sea capacity assessment and the results from that. So I really would encourage you to take a look at that as well. Uh, just the last couple of slides here. Some of their key findings from the Ocean Discovery League. I'll let you read them, but I'll pick out a few key ones here. Prioritizing deep sea research, deep sea exploration is essential. Um, detailed research and inclusion matters. Small island developing states um, have different priorities for exploration and research. That is so key for us to always remember. The priorities of different countries in different locations around the world are not always the same. More deep sea submergence vehicles are needed globally. Um, Non-research assets could be available for deep ocean research. And this is what I was saying before. You have people who have the time, people and expertise but they don't necessarily have the research immediately available to them. Two minutes, thank you. Uh, this might seem like an amazing shopping list and wish list of things, and it's not easy, it's not cheap, um, and there's a lot of things that come in uh, geopolitically, financially, but there are ways that we can try to tackle some of these issues, at least within lower cost methods. And so this is an example of one thing they did uh, within the deep sea capacity assessment is look at every economic exclusive zone for every country and assess how much contains deep ocean. So that's waters um, deeper than 200 meters in this case. But they also break that down into different categories. So 200 to 1,000, once two kilometers, two to four, four to six. And so if you take the entire Spanish um, EEZ, in this case, it's not highlighted, but it does include the Canary Islands. 92.4% of the EEZ contains waters deeper than 200 meters. And if you take just the Canary Islands, it's 99%. And so that presents a real, real challenge to learn more about the Canary Islands past, particularly for those deeper cores, deeper missions. And so we need deeper technology to be able to make sure we're not biasing our information. Um, I'll kind of skip over this, I think, and maybe just highlight uh, so Southern Europe is what uh, Spain was included in this case. And they were looking at different, um, the importance of, of different things. So expert, do you have the expertise? Do you have the technology and importance? And this is not necessarily reflective of Spain. This was gathered over Southern Europe in general. 
So it just kind of shows that there is, you know, the Canary Islands are not representative of all of Southern Europe. And so you have to dig deeper into this data and start going now, what they want to do next year by region and regions of importance, not just by countries, because Spain versus the Canary Islands in terms of its priorities, I'm sure many of you will agree, is very different when it comes to marine research. Um, and so this is actually something that's only live until Monday. This is a survey which is talking about deep sea research and imaging systems. So what the Ocean Discovery League are looking to do next year is um, looking for input that will help guide their team and collaborators to assess technical and usability needs. This is key here for low cost, easy to use deep ocean research and imaging systems. And so again, I can send these to anyone or provide you the link over the course of today. And I think I'm coming to my last thing now. Um, this is basically for the Canary Islands as a case study of lessons between the eruptions of Togoro and also from Cumbria Vieja to look at these four really key questions because, you know, and the IEO and the people involved were thrown into both of these events, particularly for El Hierro. So these key questions, what knowledge, tools, technology, and data do you, do you wish to have beforehand looking back? What were the greatest challenges met at the time in rapid response? What could you recommend in preparation for a geocrisis for other countries and other regions? And is there a particular technology or instrument you wish you or that you could prioritize in terms of maybe research in the future? So I'll leave those up there as kind of final thoughts. Thank you. Buenas tardes, everyone. I am AJ Jones. I'm the Volcano Stories content collaborator. And today I'll be talking to you about the power of Volcano Stories as a tool for engagement of science to the people who need it most, residents and tourists of the Canary Islands. What is Volcano Stories is the first question I'm sure you're thinking of. Volcano Stories originally started during the 2021 eruption when we realized as a geoscience and sustainable tourism company that we were in a particularly unique position to document how residents were dealing with the emergency. Because we have less limits in terms of waiting for funding and waiting to ask for permissions and preparing a paper, thus we were able to get right in and start documenting some of the things that might have been lost. Since 2001, there's been a lot of change in Volcano Stories and it has completely evolved. It is now a multimedia project with sub-projects, our La Palma project, our sustainable tourism project, and the Volcanic Readiness project. And this is it just now. We've got much more things coming, so please visit the site. <laughs> I'm quite proud of it. And we have these sub-projects because we wanted to distinguish what our priorities are in the Canary Islands and how, yes, we are a sustainable tourism company, but also we wanted to reflect that we care about how La Palma is going to reconstruct in the next 10, 20 years and how if you create the resources now, we might be able to continue and document how residents are feeling and the aid that they are being provided and the roads and etc. So that we were hoping to collect these resources together for a long-term project to watch as La Palma reconstructs over the next few years. And furthermore, we would like to, we've got our volcanic readiness project because something that we have noticed through our research and our work is that Unfortunately, there was a lack of awareness with particular questions when we asked a volcanic survey. I'm going to come back to that later. And, of course, that's particularly important in the Canary Islands. And thus, this uh, volcanic readiness project is quite crucial. Our aims through this project. So, our aims are to create a system to decentralize science. What I mean by decentralized science is the way that science has been set up in most countries is there are particular organizations and particular people who have access to publication research funding and thus it often leaves certain voices out of the picture. Furthermore, with centralized science, there is a particular system that you have to go through 
for example, you have to find a research niche in the research gap, apply for funding, not get the funding, reapply for funding, etc. And there's a long period of time before you might be able to do the science you were really excited for. We've also found that through centralized science, sometimes a key group is left out of this equation, and that is the residents. And I'll expand a little bit more on that in the next slide. Our next aim is to avoid the miscommunication of sciences. In particular, we do this through science communication of our staff and students. And again, I'll do this in the next few slides. Another aim is to engage the public in science. And I've touched briefly about why this is important, but particularly because at the end of the day, we do love volcanology, and sometimes it can feel awesome and interesting to observe and research, and I certainly do feel privileged to do so. But it is and can be a crisis, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, and thus we need to engage the, the most at-risk group, the residents, and making sure that they feel connected to science once again and not disenfranchised by science. And the final one is to create collaborations. And we're very lucky to recognize quite a few faces in here and many of the organizations through Geo Tenerife. And I'm, I'm hoping maybe for some more later on, I don't know. So this is my slide about decentralized science. I've, I've touched briefly on it, but um, I wanted to also be open about there are negatives to decentralized science. There is a, definitely a reason why <laughs> the global scientific community is organized in a centralized manner. And for example, there's a much more structurally integral review system with centralized science. You know, when you, you send your paper off for review and then it gets into a journal. And that is really important. And we, we have decided that we've observed that we would like to come up with a more robust review system. And this is something that we're actively working on right now and coming up with solutions on how we can create a review system for our work before it becomes public. Furthermore, as I said, one of the key aims of Volcano Stories is collaborations. One of the most important reasons why it's our, one of our key aims is so that we can have access to more expensive machinery and methodology as I'm sure we can afford some stable isotope machines, but it's really important in order to teach incoming geologists and create collaborations internationally if they can use new methodology that we might not have access to as a small company, which is why collaborations is so very important to us. However, having gone over a couple of the negatives, I would also like to tell you why we find it very interesting, the system that we've found that we can fit into within decentralized science. So because we sit at the boundary between academic science that publish through journals and publish their papers, we've found that we don't necessarily have to have that same output where our final result is an academic paper. We certainly do, and our collaborators have published our research with stuff that we have coordinated on and collaborated with. However, some of our best and my favorite formats that we have produced are much more interactive and thus can be more engaging to the residents because we're not asking you to get access to a journal and then read a paper which is full of scientific jargon that you might not understand and thus you might feel a little bit disenfranchised from. We're just asking you to watch a video and you can find it a lot easier to engage and become informed about that particular subject. One of the other aims is to avoid the miscommunication of science. The title here is mistranslation, and I don't mean necessarily from Spanish to English or English to Spanish. What I mean by that is the mistranslation of scientists' words when they go for an intermediate source to the news, because I'm sure many people in this room have found that the research that they've done and the conclusion that you come to is not necessarily the conclusion that gets output and perceived by the world. And that can be incredibly frustrating because you love your research and you found this brilliant thing, but you might not be able to get that message, that final, this is what I found out there. Whereas with the decentralized science system, we found that we've got scientists 
taking science communication training and communicating their research directly through more engaging manners, such as some of the outputs I'll, I'll show you later on, and I'm hoping you'll feel they're also engaging as I think. When I say engaging residents, I don't just mean our outputs. So yes, our outputs are designed for the target audience of residents and tourists to the Canary Islands. However, I also mean residents are involved from day one on our project. We use our very active social medias to poll residents and to receive messages and to send messages to ask residents, what are you interested? What do you need to know about where you live and what feels important to you? And once we've kind of accumulated these um, ideas, we analyze them to see if they fit with our aim, which I've already told you about. And um, they can often become a collaborative research project, which our students end up helping us to collect data with, which I'll tell you about in a bit. So this is just a short video just to show some of our, our collaborations that we have. A few people in this room, many international expertise as well. But the reason why we care so much about collaboration is to show off the expertise we have in this room, in the Canary Islands, and bring students here to start saying, look at the Canary Islands, we've got plenty going on. Please go home and please start sharing with the world why it's important to study here. And we bring our international experts to help with our collaboration and they come and fill in certain gaps of um, particular research gaps. Uh, for example, Professor Richard Brown. And they come in and they'll do some research here. And that, that's always nice to have someone do some research projects with us. And we found our collaborations to be extremely rewarding. So this diagram explains the entire process of Volcano Stories, how we get from day one to a completed project. The way that it works is, is either a collaborating research will communicate with us and say, this is something I'm interested in studying in the Canary Islands. For example, ignimbrite deposits. Or we receive a message from a resident, often many residents, and we see if it's a particularly common issue. And what we'll do is we'll see those two groups have a shared interest. There is a researcher who, wants, researcher who wants to do said researcher and residents want to know. And therefore we can get people in immediately to start the research. Once we've got our training camps on, on the go, so our volcano camp are in the front row, and we have GeoWinter and we also have Marine Sci Camp, they help us to collect this data over a period of weeks. So this, this ranged from drone flights, vegetation surveys, rock sampling, all the sciences. So they will help us collect the data with the collaborating experts so that we can get the data collected as quick as possible. Then our students will produce an academic style report alongside the collaborating expert to, to produce an academic style report for me to receive. And at this point, often the research is taken out of the loop and the collaborating researchers will publish their research, which uh, Dr. Richard Brown will be doing soon as well. Once I receive the information, the data, in its raw form and the academic style report, it's my job to transform the data which was collected by our students and produce an interactive output with the target audience of residents and tourists and with the aim to make it as interesting and engaging as possible to bring residents back into the loop of saying science is really bloody cool, come see it over here. And then the cycle begins again with the next year. This is a quick description that does a complete project from day one to finish, which actually starts from June and ends in November. So we have quite a short time scale so we can get content out quite quickly, which we believe is really useful because we can respond to events very quickly and get outputs out really quickly. So if a resident message us in, I guess, uh, June, we can hopefully get something out by November and give them an answer. 
this particular collaborati collaboration was a drone flight of some of the, the lava deltas from the 2021 eruption. I apologize to the students, but they are in this video. So um, I'll, I'll touch quickly about how the students collect the data. So recently we had a collaboration with IGN and Stavros allowed us to go and take a stratigraphy log and our students, you can see in the videos, are taking a log of the ash and tephra. The reason why we find this particularly fulfilling to have students to be brought into the Canary Islands to do research is because I have not met a single student that goes home not in love with the Canary Islands. And they leave the Canary Islands with an entirely new understanding of themselves, volcanic risk, and what they owe to the world and volcanology as a whole. And not to be too uh, passionate, but it, it does change you somewhat once you come over here and you start really thinking about what do I owe to the world? I've not got the 3D models to play around with right now because I thought that might be a bit too much, but these are some of our 3D models that we've produced. So we've got the main cone and a couple of the deltas, and we've also got El Portito, and we produce these 3D models so that you can really get in on the detail and see what they look like. And something that's really interesting is that these are all open access. They're just on our site. They're really easy to use. And we've got short descriptions on there which are written with the description in mind that it might not be a geologist reading this. It might be someone who's just found it interesting and thus it is open access to all. This is my favorite one. It's the Taogate timeline. And this in particular goes over geological reports and official statements made during three months of the eruption. And we've also got a searchable filter, which will come up in a second. So if, in particular, you are interested in researching when Evona was, a, was posted, a V-O-N-A was posted, you can, one second, <laughs> you can filter all of our data to find the days where those changed. Or if you want to learn more about defamation, you can filter our data to look at only defamation data. And we find that this is particularly useful for, for example, undergraduate students who might be studying volcanology and might want to do a project about the Canary Islands. So we produce all of this, again, online, open access, with the, the idea in mind that it is written for an average person to understand, but also not underestimating how intelligent people can be. People understand this data and we're not, we're not trying to say, oh, this, this is all silly, but people understand the data, but we just don't use the, the jargon and the terminology that you might not have access to unless you've had a very privileged education. Volcano Stories also does outputs that are not just about volcanoes. We also do environmental emergencies. During the forest fire in Tenerife, I followed it and created a up-to-date news system so that every time there was an update, it would go on our site from multiple news sources so that you could keep up-to-date through our site and not have to go to multiple sources in order to find all the information you wanted to find. And post the event, it acts as a record because now we've got evidence of everything that occurred on those days through Twitter posts, through news articles, through official um, official reports. So after the fact, you can check what was said on that particular day. As Sharon mentioned earlier, we also do a lot of videos because we find them to be particularly engaging. People like a video. I love YouTube, it's brilliant. With a video, we've got over a hundred in this one playlist, and it talks to residents, to witnesses of the eruption, to people involved in the official response to the eruption. And we like to do this at the time as a record of events, but also because it is incredibly engaging. People find it much more interesting to watch a video rather than a news article.
this particular page is about the reconstruction efforts on La Palma, and we collate evidence about the reconstruction efforts in terms of aid and uh, the physical reconstruction in terms of road and infrastructure and scientific projects that are occurring in La Palma and also other updates that are occurring that are relevant. I'll skip this video. It's very good. Have a look, everyone. Why do we do it? Unfortunately, one of our surveys found some concerning results. We surveyed some residents in Tenerife and we found that there was a particularly low understanding of what Pivoca or the volcanic plan for Tenerife was. And of course this was particularly concerning with the potential for eruptions in Tenerife. So I think that these two diagrams say it all in terms of why do we do it? Because we should. So. Please come up to me. If you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to. I've also got a billion business cards because I've ordered too many. So please come take a business card if you want one. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank the, the organizers for having me here. It's a pleasure. And yeah, we are going to talk about acoustics. In fact, the acoustic detections of the lava seawater explosive interaction from the Cumbre Vieja eruption. So first we have to define what is a marine soundscape. And this is formed by all the sounds that uh, are within the marine environment. So this has uh, three different components. First, the biophony, that are all the sounds produced by living organisms. These uh, animals use the sounds for hunting, for communication, during courtship and reproduction, and for navigation in their environment. And we can use uh, these sounds and monitor them to see the ecosystem health, the population structure, and absence, presence, and all of that. Then, of course, we have the anthropony, in which we are uh, responsible with all the marine traffic sound, the propellers, the echo sounders. We use them for navigation, resource exploration, and communication. And then we have all the non-biotic but uh, natural sounds that form the geophony. And these are the wind, the rain, and the waves. But also geological events that produce sounds, like earthquakes. So we wonder if we could monitor potentially dangerous uh, geological events like volcanic eruptions using passive acoustics. So we have, uh, uh, Eugenio has already talked about the La Palma eruption. It started September 19th, 2021, lasted 85 days. The lava flows eventually reached the sea, forming lava deltas within a marine reserve in La Palma. This produced alterations in the biota and physical chemical parameters in the surrounding waters. And of course, the Oceanographic Spanish Institute was there studying uh, drastic effects in the oceanographic parameters, biology, but also the acoustics. So what we are going to see here is how we analyze the acoustic recording uh, both during and one year after the volcanic eruption in order to investigate possible changes in the marine soundscape when very hot volcanic products, such as lava, were being spilled to the much cooler seawater. So what would they do? Uh, here you have a map of the Canary Islands, La Palma, and shaded in blue, the marine reserve of uh, Franja Marina Fuencaliente from the Natura 2000 net. And here below you can see uh, the lava extension first uh, uh, in October 19th and then uh, once the eruption finished. And here this diamond is our deployment. So here in this uh, mooring we were able to deploy three hydrophones. You see here the dates during the eruption and one year after the eruption. So we have three very different scenarios where uh, we were um, monitoring the, the acoustic ecosystem there. So we have during the eruption, while the lava was uh, being spilled to the sea and the oceanographic vessel was working by, 
then one year after the eruption, uh, and the or oceanographic vessel also there. And then uh, we left the place, and the recorder uh, was still there, and we were able to recover it uh, one month later. And also here you can see how the lava from the crater followed a uh, more than one uh, five kilometer path till the coastal reefs, and then it reached the sea. And uh, there was a part, as Eugenio already told us, that was a submerged part of the lava deltas. And in, in here you can see from the IGN uh, earthquake catalog all the earthquakes that uh, took place uh, at the same time of our acoustic recording. So, uh, how we uh, analyze all our recordings? The acoustic analysis were performed in MATLAB and Audacity. So first, we calculated metrics for the overall soundscape. For this uh, is a metric we call TOL, that are third octave levels. For this, in one minute bins for all uh, our recordings that uh, comprise more than 500 hours, we calculated the sound pressure level in decibels uh, relative to one micropascal for each of the one third octave frequency bands. And we calculated percentiles, the 5, the 50, that is the median, and the 95 for these metrics. And then we performed a manual oral exploration of the low frequencies with a signal annotation and characterization. Here you can see a spectrogram. We're going to see uh, much better later. So we looked at uh, low frequencies of uh, less than 100 hertz because look, looking at the literature, we saw that most of the geological uh, events uh, were acoustically detected at these uh, frequencies. And then we characterized the signals uh, using their waveform, the frequency component, and the sound levels, and also the intervals between each signal. And with all this data, we uh, prepared a detection algorithm and applied it uh, for the recordings during and after the, the eruption. And we tried to establish possible sources of these sounds. So here we have some results. Remember, we have three different scenarios. Uh, first, during the eruption, with our vessel there and the natural sounds. Then one year after, with our vessel there, no eruption and natural sounds. And then also one year after, uh, only the natural sounds. And also remember, we are looking at uh, the low frequencies. So here we are representing the sound levels here and the octave bands here. So 10 hertz and 100 hertz. The solid lines represent the median values, and then the, the shaded areas are the, between the, the lowest and the highest percentile. So we have in red the medians during the eruption that we can see how are clearly higher than one year after the eruption that are practically the same. So we have here more than uh, 13 dB difference in sound levels at low frequencies. And uh, if you don't remember, the decibels are a logarithmic scale, so 13 dB difference is quite a lot. So yeah, there was a clear difference. So we explore these frequency bands at lower than 100 hertz. Here is an example, a spectrogram. The frequency, the time, you see it's a two hour sample, and the color bar sound intensity. And we detected this uh, kind of uh, spikes that are uh, impulsive sounds, uh, like explosions. So we wanted to check if these were natural or artificial by looking at the interpulse interval, because uh, if this were like um, seismic exploration, it would have a regular pattern, like for example, every three seconds, one pulse. And we saw that, in fact, no, this was quite random. And then we also looked at the apparent sound level to see if it always came from the same direct source. And then we also saw that, no, it was highly variable. So yeah, it seems like a natural sound that is coming uh, not from a single uh, well-detected source. 
And then when we looked uh, at one of these signals, we discovered that they were in fact made by two pulses, all of them. So we, you see here the waveform, the first and the second pulse. And here the spectrogram, we can see that the first pulse was uh, always centered at 15 hertz, and then the second pulse was uh, more dispersed and at lower frequencies. And here we uh, again uh, represent this and characterize well, the, some acoustic metrics, the interpulse interval within the signal, their, um, the peak uh, um, level, their peak frequency, as I have said, and the quick rising time to the first pulse. So, as I said before, we perform a manual count, counting uh, more than 800 explosions during uh, our survey. And then we applied a strict algorithm detecting uh, only 140 explosions. We wanted to rule out the possibility of this being uh, the earthquakes, as this can uh, be detected underwater. So here you have a representation of uh, the earthquakes as vertical lines in time for both our uh, recording periods during the eruption and one year after the eruption. Uh, using the, the IGN uh, catalog again, you see the, all the earthquakes we have uh, during the eruption and one year after. So for our acoustic events, uh, we have again our manual count all here and also the algorithm count and non-detection nor, uh, algorithm nor manual one year after. And we'll, if we look closely, here we have the earthquakes and the acoustic uh, events in time. We zoom in uh, some of the days and we see that not the timing nor the pattern uh, are a match. So yeah, uh, this seems like uh, totally unrelated. And then we have here again our, uh, our events, the waveform, the double poles, the spectrogram, a longer spectrogram containing several ones, and here a frequency spectrum where we can see the uh, sound level and the frequency. So here you see the two pulses, the peak frequencies. And we started looking in the literature possible similar sources. Here we have acoustic recordings of a submarine uh, eruption. And the first thing we see is that the, the lowest component, the frequency, are very similar in the lowest part. But then uh, the signal waveform is pretty different. But this can be explained because this again was a submarine uh, eruption where the lava met the, the sea water at depth and directly. And then uh, our scenario is quite different. It's a subaerial eruption. The lava followed a more than five kilometer path before entering the, the seawater. So that may change the physical chemical properties and then the, the, sound, uh, the sound explosion. In another um, submarine eruption, we, uh, they reported a diffuse event. And this could be similar to some of ours. We are still looking at that. And then we found a quite similar signal. The waveform is quite similar, like you can see here. But this is an acoustic recording of a subaerial volcano. Okay, so the duration is longer, which uh, makes sense because of the sound transmission in air and underwater. And then the authors describe this and first uh, the first pulse as being an explosion with the while the, the magmatic um, uh, material uh, exploded, and then uh, a, a cool-off of the, ga the gas and, and then a cool-off of the material. So maybe uh, we have this uh, in here, in the submerged part of the lava deltas. Uh, some part was uh, fracturing and then emitting this first pulse, and then they were uh, being cooled off by the seawater emitting this sound. So as concluding remarks, in fact, yes, the subaerial volcano can affect marine soundscape at 80 meters depth and more than five kilometers distance of the source. We detected explosive events at depth that could uh, be result of the lava seawater interaction. We highlight the importance of monitoring the soundscape uh, from the eruption to a more stabilized ecosystem in La Palma. 
And again, yeah, the passive acoustic monitoring, it's highly relevant to study areas of difficult access, like this one, that are potentially dangerous, as has been uh, said earlier. So thank you. Hello. Yeah. OK, first of all, as you can see, this is uh, not my talk. This is uh, something that was put together by, the, by our colleague uh, Isabel Ferreira. Unfortunately, she cannot be here with us to explain this, so you are going to have to you know, put up with my explanation, which is maybe not as good as, as hers, but uh, I will try to translate uh, my best. <laughs> you know? So this is going to be about uh, bacteria, about what happened to bacteria uh, around the, the uh, volcanic eruption in La Palma when the lava uh, fell in the, in the water. And, uh, well, as you have uh, heard before, today there was this eruption. Do we have a pointer here? Yeah. There was this eruption in September 2021 in the subaerial uh, eruption here in this point. And uh, it was uh, a, very, a very long eruption. Uh, compared to, to the recorded history. And at some point, uh, the, the lava reached the, the ocean. No? And uh, by that time, uh, we had our ships uh, from the Spanish Institute of Oceanography going to this, uh, to this point where the, the lava was expected to, to hit the water, maybe. So the, the first ship arrived there uh, on September 26, and the arrival of the lava uh, to the ocean was uh, uh, a couple of days later. So we were there since the very beginning. These are images that you have seen before of the lava entering the ocean. Well, but apart from lava, there was also lots of ashes falling in the water, which also we expect that will have an effect. This is going to have. Uh, it's going to be very hard for us to disentangle this because we don't have any records from before the ashes started to fall in the in the water, right? So, but we have, just keep in mind that we may have these two effects. Okay, so these cruises were uh, multidisciplinary cruises where we characterized uh, all the, the morphological variations in the, in the structure of the, of the seafloor. We also studied the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the water. And uh, we also wanted to, to know what would be the, the effect on planktonic communities, right? So there you have some examples of what ashes did to the to the benthic uh, communities, but uh, there was uh, nothing so evident about what was happening in the in the water column. Right? So, well, we used uh, our usual workhorse, the oceanographic rosette, which is equipped with uh, bottles that you can close at uh, you know at any desired depth where you have detected a, a change in properties or something interesting. And then you have also uh, an array of sensors in the, the bottom of this uh, rosette that uh, will measure temperature, conductivity, pH, uh, fluorescence, oxygen, anything. Right. So this is uh, is what we did. Uh, we did this uh, in different ways. Uh, at some points, uh, we used the rosette to just take uh, depth profiles, just uh, vertical depth profiles in one spot. You know, as you see here, the these points here. At some points, we uh, did also toyos. Toyos uh, means that uh, we would take the rosette in the water and then start moving the ship and going up and down with the rosette so that we get this zigzag pattern. And then we can swipe very quickly a very, a very long stretch of, uh, of the water column and, and see uh, the properties. And we are also able to close bottles you know, whenever we see something interesting. As you can see here, there was uh, this is turbidity, for example, in this uh, in this graph. Uh, we saw some interesting things there, like uh, these uh, layers of turbidity very close to the to the uh, to the lava delta. Uh, there was a, a very large impact, and then we had this uh, these uh, two plumes, one in the surface, one about uh, 100 meters, where you would see increased. Uh, um, Turbidity, uh, probably due to the presence of uh, hyaloclastites and, and also of, uh, of ashes from, from the atmosphere. Right, this is, uh, and we also used at some point uh, these uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, what you were asking before, right? 
And uh, this allowed us to approach the, the lava delta, you know, in, in ways that we, we couldn't do with the, with the ship because it was dangerous. And then deploying this bucket and taking a surface water sample, you know, from the drone and doing it uh, safely for, for everyone. But this was uh, something really amazing for, for us that allowed us to, as you will see, to detect things that otherwise we couldn't uh, have detected. Okay, there is also uh, some publication of this, and I think uh, somebody is going to talk later about, uh, about this in more detail, so I won't go too much into this, but uh, uh, this allowed uh, to, to detect some uh, physical and chemical uh, uh, alterations next to the lava delta. But, okay, let's go for the aim of this presentation. Uh, we, were interested in, uh, we were interested in looking at uh, microbial diversity, and basically, so that you understand a bit the, the process of what we did, we just uh, took water samples with all the small microbes in there. We filtered them, so we collected all the biomass on a filter. We extracted the DNA from these filters, and then we used uh, uh, we amplified fragments of the of the ribosomal RNA gene. Uh, using universal primers so that we would get a representation of every possible microbe in the in the sample, right? After sequencing this, uh, we just uh, organized the, the samples into, so the sequences into uh, these ASVs, which is amplified sequence variants, basically into different types of, of sequences that would uh, roughly belong to maybe species or maybe some other uh, level of, of uh, taxonomical depth, right? So let's think of them, you know, roughly as species for the for the purpose of this talk. Okay, if we have uh, these types of uh, of uh, information, the first thing we may want to do is uh, look at how diverse the, the communities are there. So this is an index, this KO1, that uh, reflects the diversity in both in terms of, of richness of, of species, but also in terms of evenness, how evenly distributed they are. Right? So these are the two legs of diversity, let's say. This index combines uh, both, and the number here is just a number that tells you the higher the number is, the more diverse the sample will be. Right? So we have samples in blue before the lava, before the lava reached the ocean, in red after the lava reached the ocean, and this cluster here uh, represents those samples that uh, were collected uh, in the, during the first cruise in September of uh, in September 21, and this other cluster was a bit later in uh, October 21, right? And this is uh, one of the drone samples. What you can see is that there is a slight increase in diversity from September to to October, but uh, really we can't really tell whether this is the effect of uh, the volcano or just the normal evolution of the system throughout, the, you know, through time. But uh, we have an indication, at least on one of the, of the drone samples, that the diversity was much higher. This is this sample here. That had uh, 238 uh, exclusive uh, ASVs, so exclusive uh, species that didn't show up in any other sample. And these were also quite abundant, like about 6% of, of all the reads, of all the sequences that we had, so this is an indication that something was different there. Uh, we can plot this information also as, as beta diversity. This, that would be, this is a sort of PCA analysis uh, where you can put all the samples, and again, uh, in blue you have samples before the lava reached the ocean, in red, samples after the lava reached the ocean. And basically, uh, what you get here is the, the closer the samples are, each dot represents a, represents a sample, the more similar the samples are in their composition, in the, in the species that are there. And the farther they are, the more different they are, right? So we have two clusters, again, like before, like the, the ones in, in September, the ones in October. This is something that we saw also in the, in the, just in the number of, uh, of sequences in the, in the diversity. But then we see that the drone samples are very, very different from anything else, right? This is something that without the drone, we could have not uh, seen. So these are this bunch of samples that were collected very, very close to the, to the lava delta. So what was in there? This is just a, a rough representation, not going into too much detail to all the uh, more than 3,700 uh, different sequences that we had. Just uh, grouped by, by families. 
Right, where you can see, well, before the lava and after the, the lava reached the, the ocean, there is not much of a difference, and not much of a difference, you know, in the, in the general composition of the communities between September and October. There is a bit of difference, but not a lot. But then we have this bunch of samples here, the drone samples, which are very, very different, right? They don't look at all like, uh, like the others. And going into more detail into these samples, uh, we see that, uh, well, this is a plank sample just taken using the same uh, uh, technique, the, the drone. So just to make sure that, uh, you know, it's not something that we are making up by collecting the samples in a different way. But, uh, you know, this sample was collected also with a drone, but farther away from the, from the lava delta. And here you have that there is, again, uh, quite a difference, you know, if you are far away or if you are close to the lava delta. And what do we have in this, uh, in, especially in this pink uh, uh, part of, of here? This is the, the family uh, Thion microspirales, which are uh, gamma proteobacteria, and especially uh, many sequences of the genus uh, Thion microraptus, which is actually uh, something that you find uh, very often in around deep sea hydrothermal vents. And these uh, organisms are capable of, of oxidizing uh, metal sulfides. So this is a uh, this is something that, that is growing there that uh, is characteristic of hydrothermal vents of places where there is uh, volcanic activity. Also, doing a different uh, analysis, just going for samples where we had a, a very uh, thick, uh, a very thick layer of, uh, of uh, turbidity, you know, samples 39 and, and uh, 36, and a bit uh, enhanced turbidity, but much lower levels in, in sample in station two. Uh, you can see that the, at the points where there is uh, enhanced turbidity, we have a different community, you know, in, especially in these two bars here, which are actually representing the SAR 3 to 4 uh, clade, which is a, a, a group of bacteria that, uh, with many representatives that have the potential for, uh, for doing a chemoautolithotrophy of, uh, of sulfur, so they can grow aut uh, autotrophically on, on sulfides. And uh, we also have a lot of archaea that uh, are able to oxidize uh, ammonia, right? So again, uh, microbes that can live on reduced uh, products that are commonly found around uh, hydrothermal emissions. Okay, and this was uh, basically it. Uh, there are two major conclusions, like, uh, well, if, if we had the state, you know, with only with the uh, with the normal CTD samples, we, have, we would have missed uh, a lot of, uh, of the response because there was no massive response, you know, in all the samples except for those really, really close to the, to the uh, lava delta. And this, uh, this is interesting because if you think of the, the mantra of the microbiologists, uh, you know, that we, that we repeat all the time, like everything is everywhere, then the environment selects, uh, you think, well, this is disproving it in some way. On the other hand, uh, I would say, well, it's, uh, it's quite uh, remarkable that within days to, to a few days to a few weeks, you get the development of these communities, you know, out of, of nothing, almost. So I, I suspect that there must be lots of, of hydrothermal, you know, points not very far away, you know, where the, the seed for this kind of, of communities is coming from. And also the other uh, significant conclusion is that, uh, you know, we really need to, to put drones, these UAVs, uh, into the, the picture because they, are, they allow us to, to take uh, samples and to collect information that otherwise we wouldn't uh, be able to collect. And that's basically it. Lovely. Thank you very much to all the speakers uh, and particular congratulations to AJ. Well done. <laughs> that was not an easy task. Um, well done. Do we have Okay. Lovely. So right. for the delegates who are joining us online, please remember you can put uh, questions in the chat uh, and we'll ask the experts for you here. Um, and I'd just like to reiterate how amazing and wonderful it is to see all these incredible researchers, scientists, institutions coming together, collaborating, sharing knowledge, uh, and helping to show the extraordinary science that's being done here. And I love these talks that uh, show us that these natural processes also have wonderful outputs as well in terms of 
biodiversity, nature, um, and it just reminds us that we're, we're guests here, really, and, and nature is the one that's in control. Any questions from the floor, first of all? Yes. Hi, Judith. Hello, uh, I'm Judith, I'm from Barcelona, and this question is for AJ. <laughs> Thank you for your talk, it was a very interesting and very necessary project, I think. And my question is, um, I've seen you uh, done many interviews to residents of La Palma, but um, I wonder if you have also conducted research um, in a quantitative way, like using questionnaires and so on in order to assess and somehow quantify the psychological impact, for example? Sorry, AJ, I might just jump in if that's okay. Uh, because it's a really important and key question. Um, and AJ might not be up to speed on one of the things that we're doing in the background. Uh, because you're absolutely right, it's so important. Um, and all of this project came about originally on this iPhone, because we found ourselves um, in La Palma and we wanted to start recording. And one of the things that really struck us is that uh, during the emergency at any one time, there were up to a thousand operatives on the ground dealing with the emergency, uh, which was extraordinary. It was a massive response for a small island, but not one single social scientist. Um, and I think this is one of the things that we really need to think about. And as a, as a psychologist for you, this is important. Actually, something I want to talk to you about, um, because we have to think about the messaging, about accompanying people when they're being sort of accompanied out of their houses, not just by the security forces, but also for people who can help them to put this into context as well. Uh, and also for the security forces as well. I know they did have some psychological support after the event, but all of these things are so very important. And the psychological impacts in La Palma are being felt to this day. There's a really deep mental health impact. We're only just starting to look into some of that. Um, and it's ongoing. And a lot of this is down to a lack of information. Um, and there is a lot of information out there. Sometimes it's just difficult to access. So some of what AJ does really well is research what's already out there, but put it together in a way that people can access easily. So I don't think it's that anybody is sort of hiding information or not wanting to say it, but maybe we don't think about taking that final step of making it available in a way that's interactive, easy, and, and attractive for them to follow. And sometimes it's maybe areas we haven't thought of putting together. Um, so we are now collaborating with a fantastic international team. We did some work with National Geographic, with GNS in New Zealand, uh, with a team from NASA as well. And we've got, hopefully, we've just heard we've got some funding to go forwards uh, in a multi-year research project in La Palma that's going to tie together a lot of what we did. I mean, I'm a journalist, I'm not a scientist, so all of this to begin with was just a journalistic exercise, but using AI on what we've got already and going forwards with more structured interviews, more structured research, we're going to take this through uh, forward and, and, and draw some conclusions um, thanks to some funding that's come from New Zealand, which is amazing, but we don't know too much about that yet, but that, that's coming up. But thank you for your question. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, Max. Um, my question is also for AJ. Uh, I'm Max Pizarro. I'm from the University of Mississippi. Oh, OK. Um, and Sharon, feel free to uh, butt in as well. Um, but with Volcano Stories evolving the way it is, what styles of research are you looking for people like researchers like myself to bring to the table to help you guys out as much as we can? Do you want me to start, or you go ahead? Go ahead. Thank you very much. Something that's particularly important, as I'm hoping that everyone was able to hear from my presentation, is that it can be any volcano science, sustainable tourism related. It can be about La Palma's reconstruction. But the, the, key, the key thing is it needs to be about the residents. It needs to have some output that c we can use to help residents. Science is great, but science for science sake sometimes lacks what we need to give to the world. So any, any science would be brilliant, but we just have to find a way to collaborate our two sides of the story in order to reach an output that is engaging for the people in the end of the day.
Thank you, AJ. That's absolutely right. Uh, and actually, one of the things I find really exciting is that in some of our training programs, like Volcano Camp and Marine Sci Camp that we have here, we deliberately uh, work with students from a variety of backgrounds. Because when you do that, and they're living together, working, learning together in this amazing environment that we call the Canary Islands, they pool ideas and they come up with some really exciting suggestions. So just if you just tell me the subject that you study, just so that we have a, an idea of the breadth. So you are a... I'm an igneous petrologist. Yes. Petrology and geochemistry. Yes. Earth dynamics and resources. Yes. Volcano volcanology hazards. Nice. Um, earth science and astronomy. Yes. Earth science. Yes. Psychology. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, mine's going to take a while. Um, international disaster management, humanitarian response. I love it. Geology. Yes. Earth science and mathematics. Geography. Okay, so we have quite a mix. And if you think of a traditional team or a traditional field trip, you're all thinking along the same lines. Um, you might all have the same sort of training, the same sort of background. And what I think is really exciting here is that they're coming from different countries, different backgrounds, uh, and that comes up with some new initiatives, some new viewpoints that we can then uh, you know, flex into these sort of research programs, which we hope will be of utility. And we're not here to undermine any of the science that the official institutions are doing, quite the reverse. We work very closely with them. We make sure that we're not going to sort of put our foot in it scientifically, but it is utilising all of these different viewpoints uh, and trying to give it a new vision that people can really access with. Uh, and it's amazing what Eugenio does as well in his Volcana project. He also invites a multidisciplinary team. He doesn't have to. He's worked incredibly hard to raise all of this funding. He could just take his own team on there, but he does open up his cruises. When we went first onto the boat, not long after the eruption, in, in I think it was January or February 2022, I was so surprised to see the breadth of scientists who were on there, who are all working so beautifully together um, in a really collaborative environment. And I think that's a real example for people to follow. Yes, Jay. Uh, um, so, Francisco Lechon from... Complutense University of Madrid has a question for Jesus Arieta. His study on the impact of the La Palma eruption on the local marine bacterial plankton communities has been very interesting to me. Are there similar studies for the 2011 El Liero eruption? Have these studies been compared? Uh, okay. Well, we haven't made a, a comparison so far. Uh, we did, uh, well, not, not me, but Isabel, actually, the... <laughs> The, the person who, who collected this information, she published a paper already on what happened in the initial phases uh, in El Hierro. Yes. Thank you, Chechu. From the floor, any more questions? Uh, Sharon, I have Perdón, Pablo. I don't need to the microphone. <laughs> 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 So uh, um, you were showing wiggles, which is, I think, uh, what I like um, uh, a lot about the physical processes. So uh, if I understood properly, you think it was the explosions uh, that were happening under water or explosions on the crater that propagate through the air and then excite the water? So what is your take on the origin of the signals? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is sometimes uh, a bit confusing. Um, yeah, the proposal is that uh, those were uh, underwater explosion from the submerged part of the lava deltas. Uh, Alba is going to talk about uh, something uh, of the lava deltas, so we'll see. But uh, yeah, because um, in acoustic uh, propagation, sound propagation, uh, if it was uh, a subaerial uh, sound, on the, or the earthquakes from, from the earth crust, then um, it shouldn't uh, propagate very well from the medium change uh, in underwater. So it, it shouldn't be like uh, so clear, the signals. So yeah, those were produced uh, underwater. It will have help to have uh, also acoustic sensors on the air. So. I think uh, CESIC uh, had uh, a research team that had acoustic monitoring, so it probably would be good to talk to them, yeah. I definitely would, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> nice. 
We have another question online? From the, from the chat, yeah. This is from Olivia Hurd, and it's a question for AJ. Her question is, uh, for researchers not local to the areas that they study, what methods of communication would you recommend um, using when communicating with residents um, about their research? Sorry, could you repeat that, please? One second, let me try to read this a little better. Um, for researchers not local to their areas of study, what methods of communications would you recommend using when communicated with residents about their research? Okay, thank you. I think something that I in particular struggle with is I'm not very fluent in Spanish yet. And there's something to be said about the nuances you can lose when you speak another language. Um, for example, there are certain concepts that I just can't quite convey as well as I would like to. And I think there's something very important about when you're conveying your research, it, it would be ideal to do it in their language, in your language that you speak, primarily because a lot of science has left people feeling disenfranchised and people feel disconnected to science, uh, in some way feel like some scientists are gatekeeping, not not on purpose, but just through the the system in which we do science means that a lot of science gets behind a paywall. And thus, the thing is, we would recommend that you collaborate with other local organizations when you are trying to when you're trying to communicate your research, contact local organizations, ask their advice on how to correctly communicate your results to the people who need to hear them. And that way, <laughs> it's communicated with all the nuances of the local language and culture. That's such a good reply, thank you. And in fact, uh, there are the institutions here, but there are also other um, groups in the Canary Islands, for example, who do an incredible job uh, doing some outreach locally. Uh, one of them is Volcanes de Canarias, who are very active. Uh, they're um, available, well, they, they publish in Facebook, on Instagram, but there's also the lovely Fundación Teleforo Bravo, who works very, very closely, and we have Jaime with us here today. Perhaps you might like to say just a little bit about the sort of work that you do trying to engage local people in science here in the Canary Islands. Thank you, Sharon. We just uh, try to um, organize, uh, you know, cycles with uh, some lectures. Uh, we we choose normally a topic. For example, we have choose last year. We organized several lectures in in Puerto de la Cruz, where uh, you know uh, several scientists from different fields uh, talk about different topics about uh, the volcanic eruption. Uh, we also try to. Uh, you know, um, speak a little bit about uh, the work of the scientists. For us, it's very important that the Canarian society uh, know the amount of work that the Canarian scientists are, are having. And uh, they should be social reference, you know, because it's very easy to have a, a, you know, a soccer player as a, as a reference, but it's more difficult uh, to, for the, to create uh, that kind of... of, of encouragement and um, uh, support to the to the science work you know and for us that's very important too and, and we normally organize hikes with experts uh, in geology botany etc just for the, the the local people to to learn about uh, the values of, of of Canary Islands and we also work you know, with institutions like yours where we are having a fantastic time, uh, you know, not only providing information about uh, environmental values of Canary Islands, but also learning about people from, from other backgrounds and, and other cultures. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Sharon. Thank you. Jaime, thank you, and thank you for all the work that you do here in the Canary Islands. Um, it's really beautiful, the, the connection that you have with people and, and with your islands, um, and it's, it's lovely to work with you. One quick story I wanted to tell you is that, of course, one of the outputs of Volcano Stories was a film that we made, which we completely self-funded, called Lava Bombs. 
uh, and the first lava bombs <clears throat> was about the eruption. Uh, and actually, it was quite a challenging film to make, but also a challenging film to show, because it's a film that, without any gloss or varnish, shows the impacts of the eruption on lots of different groups of people. Uh, and when we first released the film, the first thing we did is have a few sessions with locals in La Palma, in small cinemas, in small viewing spaces, uh, with scientists, with politicians who came with us, with emergency managers. And it was a really important exercise to do because um, on the one hand, they felt that their views and their voices were being heard. But then we would have a, a question and answer session very much like this, where we would help residents to pose their questions. Because after an event that is traumatic, um, not only do they have questions, they might have resentments because they might feel certain things have happened. And there's a real healing process in having these question and answer sessions where they feel they can really be heard. Um, and one of the ones that really sticks out in my mind is that we showed the film in a school, 14 and 15 year olds, tough crowd, let me tell you, 15 year olds. Um, so we showed them the film and I said, who here didn't like the film? And there was a very sure 15 year old boy who said, I didn't like the film. And I said, fantastic, tell me why. I'm really interested in your point of view. Tell me why you didn't like the film. And he said, well, I'm from Puerto Naos. My family is evacuated and I don't believe a word anybody is telling me about the science in Puerto Naos. I said, I'm so glad you said that because actually we had with us one of the scientists who was responsible for doing some of the monitoring. And there ensued a really interesting conversation between them where he could talk about the frustrations he had with lack of information, but she could also talk about all the work and the effort that was being made. So sometimes it's not that things aren't being done, sometimes there's that little lack, that last link of communication. And if we can help people to understand better all the work that's been done. And the one thing I always say when we show lava bombs, whatever you think of, um, what happened here, if you see every single person we interviewed in that film, not one of them has had a good night's sleep in a long time. The work everybody did here during that eruption was extraordinary, um, under very difficult circumstances, and I really commend the work everybody did. Which isn't to say we haven't got things to learn, that's very healthy, uh, and that's something that's being done, which is amazing, um, but yes, it was, it was an extraordinary event, and sometimes we need to understand a little bit and have those dialogues which are so healthy to, to understand everybody's viewpoint. Any more questions from the floor? Yes, thank you. Well, my name is Michael. I'm a retired biologist, and so my question is directed to Jesus. Uh, and it deals with... Uh, chemotrophic bacteria which uh, were found near the coast during the vol volcanic event which usually not are there and uh, the first question is uh, are these bacteria usually but in very less concentration there in that field and the second does this uh, is this related uh, to possible uh, deep sea volcanism which sometimes may appear in Canary Islands. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, if it doesn't need to be specifically related to deep sea volcanism, but uh, maybe to, to shallow volcanism, you know, there are like uh, places like Fuencaliente, which is not too far away, where we have uh, evidence of uh, hydrothermal emissions, for example. That would be one thing. The other thing is, uh, you know, referring to this uh, hypothesis about everything is everywhere, and then the environment selects. Uh, when we see the, the uh, distribution of, this, of these communities, of microbial communities, usually they have a power, they follow a power law. So we have a few a few species, a few types that are very abundant, you know, and make most of the population. And then we have a very, very long tail of things that are present at very, very low levels. So it could be, you know, within this tail that we have just a few representatives that come from maybe quite far away, you know, and they are enough, they are the seed enough to, to start this, uh, this growth when 
when the conditions are favorable. This means that the reactor may survive without Sorry. volcanic. Uh, but this uh, uh, means that these bacteria may survive for a very long, long time without uh, any uh, metabolism. Well, or with very, very low. Actually, okay. you know, as dormant cells that can, we know from, from several types of bacteria, you know, dormancy is, uh, is quite a, a, a well-known and well-extended, you know, through, through all of types of bacteria, that uh, they, they have this property that they can go to a very low metabolism and then last for very long, you know. Okay, thanks. That's lovely, thank you. Any more questions from the floor here? Thank you, Peter. Um, hi, my name is um, Peter, and I definitely don't have as much like a background in biology really at all. But I was curious about um, the Jesus again um, about like um, the succession of like organisms after the eruption and like what that looks like on the scale of like months, weeks, to months after to years. Like how quickly it reverts the original um, ecosystem. Oh, I was curious about like how. Um, like the time scales of how the ecosystem by um, the lava deltas like reverts back to the original ecosystem and like the time scales of how long that would take. Okay. Okay, we don't have a lot of evidence on, on that, you know, on, on, on lava deltas, but uh, what we know from El Hierro, for example, which is a very different uh, situation. Uh, in El Hierro, we have uh, still hydrothermal emissions you know, that have been continuing after the eruption for, for a decade already. And we know that these are fueling you know, these communities, and these communities are you know, the substrate where other things can, can chew on. You know? So in, in El Hierro, we have seen a, a very rapid recovery, and part of it must be uh, due to this. For Lava Delta, where you know, the hydrothermal emissions will cease very rapidly, you know, uh, it's probably going to take a lot longer because there is no energy input, you know, into the system like uh, there was in, in El Hierro. So I would, my suspicion is that it will take uh, a bit longer, you know, in, in Lava Deltas. That's great. Thank you, Chechu, for that. Um, I actually have a question for Sam. Um, I have to say, again, I love the the the, the way you're trying to push your agenda forwards, uh, but we have quite an array of institutions here and delegates online. Perhaps uh, you might tell us if, if there were to be another event, how can IAVC Submarine flex its network, if you like, to be of assistance? Because I think that'd be really helpful to talk about that just for a moment. Okay, sure. Um, would you mean necessarily during or the i guess this is an event that has is happening at this stage um yes of course i think there's one thing which is very key of course you know people will always be available to talk to the public because when whenever there is a geo crisis a geo geohazardous event the people who are on the ground are usually the, the you know the local scientists the local agencies and authorities and they have work to do they have important things to do with regarding you know crisis management and in some cases you know rapid needed data collection where the commission can potentially help in the future not just in the canary islands but any future events around the world is having a team of people who can communicate the science and know what is going on, particularly in the world of marine volcanism and coastal volcanism, who can potentially be available to talk about these things. We've talked about setting up a network of people who would be comfortable to be reached out to in the events of something happening around the world. We had this during the, uh, the Hunga Tonga eruption in 2022. There was so, so much media attention around this eruption and people were being reached out to by news and media who may not necessarily have been the right people to be reached out to. If there was already a pre-existing network with the right people, with the right expertise, who were also comfortable talking, uh, and as you said before, and AJ said about, you know, bridging that final gap of communication so that people have that trust as well. Uh, that's I think that's definitely one way we could be able to help out is to have a community of people ready who are not necessarily the boots on the ground who need to be actively 
responding to the situation. And in terms of international scientists, I think it's also important, Sam, isn't it, for them, A, to disclose when they're not an, an authority on the subject and, and maybe pass press or other people on to somebody who will, uh, but always to uh, amplify the voices of the local scientists on the ground, yes? Because we do see a lot of pseudoscience online, and it's actually quite scary. Some of these accounts may have millions of followers and they sort of add one and one and get 15 or something. Um, so what would you advise anybody who is actually doing any sort of social media, you do a lot of work uh, in terms of social media and outreach, anybody who might want to give an opinion or post something during something that has an impact on people, what are the things they should really bear in mind and be careful about? And you hit that exactly right, which is don't be afraid to say no um, in your area of expertise. And if you can pass, you know, a request you've had from the media onto someone else you know who has the right expertise, then absolutely do so. I've done it myself and people have done it for me. Um, of course, that comes down to who you know. And sometimes there can be bias in that. And unfortunately, sometimes that leaves out, that can leave out local scientists just because of who our networks are. I don't know necessarily everybody who might be the appropriate person uh, with the local expertise. But the more that we connect and talk to each other, I think it's okay to go through a couple of lanes of people, um, even for things like documentaries as well, not necessarily just for media responses. But when it comes to documentaries, I know I, I get reached out to quite a bit to talk and advise people about, oh, we're thinking of doing this to do with volcanoes. I'm like, okay, well, have you reached out to an Indonesian scientist as opposed to me because you want to do something in Indonesia. That's the way it should be first. Yes, I understand you might have found me through the channels of social media, but we, those of us who have followings and have networks need to be aware of who our networks are and who our connections are to make sure local voices do get heard and also amplified so that it's not always the same personalities and presenters uh, being shown through media, news interviews and through documentaries. And also I think we have a real opportunity to call out, don't we, people who are sort of either trying to make something sound more dramatic than it is or, or have a certain bias in their reporting. And certainly in the, in the recent weeks in Iceland, it's been really interesting to see a lot of certainly some of the academics that I follow calling out people who were just trying to be really categorically catastrophic about Iceland and actually trying to redirect the message to those local sources and amplifying those institutions. Do you think there's a responsibility on all of us to help redirect that message and actually do it actively? Yes. <laughs> um, no, it, obviously, you know, we don't want to put that responsibility on everybody because all of us have different, um, I guess, uh, levels of confidence in this as well when it comes to dealing with the public. So... If you don't necessarily feel comfortable responding responding to someone, um, then pass it on to someone who you can trust. And when it comes to, let's say, calling people out, calling out misinformation is one of the greatest things we can do because misinformation spreads faster than good information. It always will. And as you say, it's because people pick up big followings because they shout the loudest and they create big news headlines and scary media stories. I think even just in the past month with... Uh, eruptive activity in Iceland. There was also eruption activity at Etna and also Popocatapetl in Mexico within the space of the week. And the number of videos that went out saying the end is nigh, this is it. But that's three volcanoes that happen to be erupting, that happen to be getting media attention out of actually 16 volcanoes that erupted that day around the world. They, those three just happened to be in high profile locations that were already in the front of people's minds. Exactly, exactly. Okay, any more questions from the floor? I'll give you one final opportunity. Ah, yes, Guru. Yeah, it's a question to both you and AJ, uh, because as you are working with the Volcano Stories Project, you gain a lot of experience with communicating uh, natural disasters and hazards to local people. Is this something you will... Uh, do you have like a plan for sharing this with uh, people around the globe that perhaps has other uh, natural disasters that they have to face? That's a really good question. Um, so, yes, is the, is the short answer. One of the things we're doing is we're going to be going to cities on volcanoes in Guatemala. 
uh, and we're running three or four different sessions, uh, very much directed on different local sections of the community around the work that we're doing. So one will be directed at the scientists, one to emergency managers, politicians, but also the residents as well. Um, because we have spent the last 10 years bringing students from all over the world, thousands of students from all over the world, and a lot of scholars from all sorts of different backgrounds. And the thing that I find heartbreaking is how great the disparity is in readiness and resilience in the face of natural phenomena um, across the world. And lessons that are learnt in one place just aren't received or applied in another. Um, so last summer we showed um, lava bombs to a group of our students and one of the students was uh, from New Zealand and she was upset because she was like, oh, but we, we know all about this from day one at school uh, and I can't believe that people haven't got this you know, down pat yet uh, in the Canary Islands, which is obviously something that's being looked at. But then we had another scholar who was here from Ethiopia. He, uh, and he says, you know, I'm on the East African Rift Zone. And um, we have a whole array of hazards that we have to face, and we haven't even started having these conversations. So what we're actually actively looking to do at the moment is, is to try and secure some funding. Having, we're going to do Lava Bombs 2, which will be out soon, and that's on the reconstruction and following step by step everything that's been happening there and the messaging and how people have received that and, and what's being done. But what we'd love to do going forwards is Lava Bombs 3 and look at that globally. So we've spent some time in New Zealand in Christchurch, for example. We were there um, earlier this year talking about the impacts of, of those earthquakes and how people have recovered from it. And some of the work they've done there is so interesting because they've actually taken time to think about what they want their city to be like going forwards. They've taken time to design buildings that can survive liquefaction uh, or, or strong tremors. They've thought about what they want their central business di district to be like, so recognising the, that they don't need thousands and thousands of people in offices anymore, so it's bringing some residents back into the town. So, yeah, there's a lot to be done, um, and it's a, a really interesting area that we want to pursue, but it, it will take time, but, yeah always open to collaborations if anybody else is, is interested in looking at that. Yeah, this is, this is amazing and uh, I think we should probably wrap up this uh, session by thanks again the four speakers.